Dr. Selena Brace, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Hampton, UK. You are a researcher in the Earth Sciences Department and manage the London Natural History Museum's Ancient DNA Laboratory, working with ancient and degraded DNA in order to investigate evolutionary processes. You are one of the team that worked on the famed Cheddar Man skeleton, which is what we are going to be discussing today. Well, we're in lockdown again here in the UK. Uh, you live on a boat on the River Thames, so perhaps not so awful for you. And I know you like to run, so I can assume you're getting a lot of running done this month. But um, what about your regular projects? Are you still able to work on those? Thanks, Mark. Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, I went running along the Thames this morning, actually. Um, life on a boat is great, um, although I must say it's probably at its best in the summer months. It's, it's a little bit cold now, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm very fortunate because I'm still able to work. So um, I've been in the museum a couple of times, uh, but generally, yep. yes, I'm, um, I'm working from home. Um, I have a lot of active projects and um, I'm fortunate also to have a lot of PhD students or a couple of PhD students who are, who yeah. are generating and analysing data for me. Um, so I still have papers to write and grants to write. So yeah, it's fair to say I'm keeping busy. Well, before we get into the fascinating, quite complex world of the Cheddar Man, uh, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Selena, did you always have an interest in science and uh, paleoanthropology? I wasn't interested in science in the slightest when I was at school. Mm. Um, I love uh, English, literature, theatre, philosophy. Um, it wasn't until much, much later uh, that I got involved in science. Um, it was when I was, strangely, working for the RSPCA, an animal charity. Mm. Um, and I ended up taking a um, animal sciences course. Um, and it was then when I did that, I realised I actually had quite an aptitude for, for science and it was something that I, I really loved. Um, so I sort of came quite late to the, the field and indeed I did um, an undergraduate at UCL in zoology uh, in my late 20s, uh, early 30s um, and eventually ended up doing some molecular work with a chap there called Professor Mark Thomas um, and it was there that I then discovered about ancient DNA and ended up taking on a PhD in ancient DNA uh, with Professor Ian Barnes, uh, who I still work with um, today. And oh, yes. uh, so, yeah, that, that was that really, that started that career and uh, never looked back since. Okay, time to talk all things Cheddar Man. Now, for anyone who is unfamiliar with this story, Cheddar Man is the oldest complete skeleton ever found in Britain, uh, discovered in Cheddar, Somerset, hence the name. So uh, first of all, what can you tell us uh, about this discovery? Well, Cheddar Man currently resides on display in the Natural History Museum. Um, currently, uh, um, he's actually on loan from the Longleat Estate. Um, his story really begins in the late Victorian period uh, in Somerset, in a set of caves that are actually near a village uh, that's called the village of Cheddar. Um, the caves were initially excavated and opened to the public uh, by a retired sea captain called uh, Richard Cox Goff. He turned the caves into a tourist attraction um, because apparently um, stalactite mm. and stalagmite caves were all the rage in the Victorian era. Oh. Um, <laughs> Then in December uh, 1903, which was uh, after the death of Goff Senior, um, the son, Arthur Goff, uh, who was in charge of the caves, had organised for some workmen to be clearing a, a, a drainage ditch very close to the front of the cave. Um, there was apparently a lot of flooding used to happen at that time. The cave would often flood, so they were constantly mm. sort of blasting the earth in there to remove sediment to create drainage ditches. Yeah. Uh, but on this occasion, 1903, as they were removing the earth and the sediments, uh, they came across the skeleton of a young man. 
So um, Goff's uh, uh, show cave was actually in a very, very fierce, bitter competition <laughs> with another show cave just a few miles down the road called um, Cox's Cave. And apparently these two owners had been in bitter disputes for years. And um, I've read about this and they had like notices in the papers. And it was things along the lines of, don't go to Cox's Sham Cave. Come feast your eyes on the splendor of goths. And uh, there was really no love lost between these people. So when um, Cheddar Man was un un unearthed, un yeah, literally unearthed, yeah. <laughs> It was, um, it was a massive boon for, for Goff's caves. And um, the brothers incredibly uh, publicised it really widely. There were handbills, there were postcards of the skull. Uh, apparently they wheeled out um, eminent archaeologists to pronounce its importance. Um, mm. I think the, the body was said to be that of the oldest Englishman. Um, and they said it was potentially between 80 and 40,000 years old. So, uh, yeah, Cheddar Man kind of created quite the media storm even back in the uh, Victorian era when he was found. And what sort of position was he in, Selena, when, when he was found? So they think he was kind of like sort of curled in the side portion of this cave in, in a fissure they now called Cheddar's Fissure. Um, but of course, he, as he sort of was coming out, there was sort of bits and pieces all over the place. And so, um, but as I say, they think he was sort of curled up in the cave in this kind of quite neat position. So, you know, what about the history of Cheddar Man? Uh, who was he and how might he have lived? Um, he has quite a significant hole uh, just above his right orbital, so above his right eye, mm. um, which may have been quite a nasty abscess. So that could have been part of the cause of death, or that hole could even have been caused post-mortem. So after his death, either by sort of rain dripping from the cave or perhaps when his skull was removed from the cave. We don't know how he ended up in this cave. We don't know if maybe he just literally sort of crawled in there and laid down to die. Um, or was he actually placed there after his death? Um, mm. What we know is that communal burials um, are, more co are more common at this time. So uh, just down the road is um, Avalon's Hole, another cave site where there were um, a number of Mesolithic bodies put into that cave at the same time. Um, so, but Cheddar Man, as we're saying, is, uh, is on his own. So was he someone special? Uh, was he was he placed there because he was special or could he even have been placed there because he was not special maybe he was shunned we just we just don't mm. know um what we do know about him is that he died in his early 20s um we of course know that he he wasn't 40 or 80,000 years old he was in fact he died 10,000 years ago um uh, he has been radiocarbon dated many times over now, so we are we are very clear on on, on the the date when he died ten thousand years ago. This means that uh, Cheddar Man was alive during the Mesolithic period. So the Mesolithic period is a time before farming. So this um, is the time of the hunter gatherer. Uh, so this is when people were living in these portable animal skin tents or were taking shelter in caves, perhaps like Cheddar Gorge, um, but they certainly didn't stay in any one place. So they were a nomadic people. They would have been living off the land, moving with the seasons. They likely hunted animals such as auroch, deer, wild boar. Um, we know the kind of tools that they used. We find um, axes and microliths and spears from this period. Um, and uh, Britain itself would have, would have uh, been uh, uh, more like a woodland at this time. Mm -hmm. The landscape mm -hmm. would have been more forested woodland. Um, and interestingly, uh, uh, Britain was still connected to continental Europe at this time. Oh, right. uh, so some land masses are connected by, by land bridges. And so this is basically during uh, colder periods, during glacial periods, water mm -hmm. from the oceans is taken up into glaciers so sea levels actually drop 
and they drop so considerably in certain places that actually land is exposed and you have a land bridge between two different countries which is uh, what happens to Britain and Europe during this time. And that mm-hmm. land that's exposed that's in between is called Doggerland. Um, and that remained until in the region of um, 8,000 years ago, when it was once again flooded. Um, so I guess we could say that the Britain that Cheddar Man lived in would have looked um, quite different uh, to, be, to how we know Britain today. Uh, so was he the only skeleton in the cave or... Has anything else of interest been found? So, no, Mark, he's not the only skeleton um, in the cave. And though he certainly is the oldest, most complete skeleton, um, he wasn't the first Englishman either. Um, Hmm. Because fairly close to where Cheddar Man was found, there's another group of, uh, uh, we call it an assemblage, of uh, fragmented skeletal remains. Uh, the number of individuals here is, is is not certain because these bones are, are highly fragmented. They're, they're not complete like Cheddar Man. It's um, lots of small fragments of human remains. Um, but when but based on um, bones that are identified, the um, developmental age of those bones, the size of the bones and the sex of those bones, we think that the minimum number of individuals that this assemblage uh, S, uh, uh, represents uh, is six. Um, and this would comprise of uh, one child, two as adolescents and three um, adults. Um, these bones have been radiocarbon dated to much earlier than Cheddar Man. So these bones are around 15,000 years old. So this is from the Paleolithic period. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these people would have had an even harsher existence. The climate would have been colder. Um, indeed, it got colder still in the UK, and the UK was, in fact, uninhabitable by people between the times mm. of the Paleolithic people and then 10,000 years ago when we see Cheddar Man. These remains are, are interesting because of their age, um, but also because they show extensive signs of um, cannibalism. So what we see uh, on these bones is we see human tooths and gnaw marks. You can see where they bit into things like ribs and sucked out the, the, the marrow from these bones. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah it, it sounds pretty grisly, doesn't it? I mean, our, um, our NHM cannibal expert, Dr. Sylvia Bello, um, would be able to tell you uh, uh, much more about all these bones. Hey, maybe you should get her on here. But um, but as well as these uh, these signs of human chewing and gnawing, uh, we also see signs of post-mortem modification. Mm. And so what we have here is where several of the craniums, so the tops of the skulls, um, have been carefully, they've taken the top of the skull off rather than just smashing the skull to, to, to get out the brains you would imagine to eat the brains what they didn't is very carefully remove the skull cup napping around so the, the the edges of that and what they do is they turn it into this human mm. skull cup that's thought to be used as a ritual drinking vessel um so there are many reasons why you might have a cannibalistic behavior could be because people are hungry it can be through warfare or it can be ritualistic and it's mm. possible therefore because we see these kind of signs of these ritualistic drinking bowls that the cannibals at Goff's cave um, are actually doing this as part of some customary uh, mortuary um, practices so it's not uh, a sign of, of anger but you know a sign of love of granny that perhaps you're uh, wanting to be drinking from her skull cup. So, oh um, <laughs> I know, uh, it sounds odd now, but yeah, maybe, maybe this was the right the done thing. Um, in, imbibe, imbibing the soul of your ancestors is sort, of, sort of thing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But uh, either way, Goth's Cave is, is, is quite the treasure trove of, uh, of human remains. There's uh, some really interesting finds there, not just Cheddar Man, yeah. Well, in 2018, DNA was extracted from the skeleton of Cheddar Man and revealed some pretty interesting results. But before we get into those findings, talk a little bit about ancient DNA and the techniques that are now used to examine genomes and uncover details 
about individuals like Cheddar Man? Uh, yeah, so I am an ancient DNA researcher. So my job is literally to get DNA out of dead things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, to clarify, ancient DNA doesn't really mean or doesn't have to be about mm. age. It doesn't have to be about the age of the DNA. Um, because uh, as soon as an organism dies, the DNA in that organism will begin to break down. And so depending on the conditions that um, organism is left in uh, depends on how fast that DNA will break down. Mm. Um, so in generally speaking, if uh, a sample is in a cold place, the uh, degradation play process slows and it takes longer for the DNA to break down. And if it's in a warm environment, then that process speeds up and the mm. bonds holding the DNA together break down faster and the DNA becomes fragmented and shorter quicker. Um, I work with a variety of different types of material, uh, but it's typically um, bones or teeth, skin, um, sometimes hair, or even coprolites, so like animal dung. Um, I work in a specialised ancient DNA laboratory at the NHM. It's specialised in that it is a super, super clean lab. Uh, where we only work on degraded DNA. We prevent modern DNA from getting into the lab by wearing like full protective bodysuits, face masks, gloves, boots. Um, we... and don't you have some sort of something called DNA away? Yes. <laughs> I saw that in your documentary. It's like, that, that can't be a real product, but it is, <laughs> it isn't is. it? <laughs> it certainly is. Uh, it's kind of like a glamorous bleach. We use a lot of DNA away and we oh use a lot of bleach. Yeah, we have like UV lights that come on in the lab in the middle of the night to irradiate away any DNA. Uh, we clean everything with DNA away uh, and bleach. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super clean in there. But um, in terms of the, the sampling, once we, once we get uh, the material, which quite often comes from museums or from archaeological, zoo archaeological sites, um, I take it into the lab. If it's um, something like skin, then I would cut it into to very small pieces using a razor. If it's bone, then I, I drill a small, like a three millimeter hole into the bone um, using uh, like a dentist drill. We use a dentist drill because that goes at very, very slow speeds and we don't want the drill to heat up and uh, destroy the DNA. So we drill into the bone and release a small amount of bone powder. And then it's this bone powder or tissue uh, that then I use to extract the DNA from. I do this initially by breaking down everything that isn't DNA with enzymes. And then we basically bind the DNA to um, what's like a, a, a piece of silica. And then mm. we, we wash out everything that's not DNA, again, with chemical solutions. And we wash it all through so that we're left with DNA. Uh, after that, we essentially prepare the DNA for sequencing. So again, this is some chemical reactions, but mm. then we put it on a sequencing machine um, that will sequence the, the, the different fragments for us. So then we basically get lists of A, C, Gs and Ts and uh, we yep. use bioinformatics to, to, to put all those fragments back together again to, to create um, a whole uh, very long string of A, C, Gs and Ts. Um, and what and was the actual bone for Cheddar Man that you would have had to drill into? Is there a, speci a specific part of, of him? Yes, there is actually. So with Cheddar Man, I actually drilled a very small hole um, into his petrus. His petrus is, is the inner ear bone. Um, and that is actually one of the, or it is the densest bone in the body. Uh -huh. And so it actually seems to, um, it doesn't necessarily preserve the DNA, but it's more that it protects the DNA mm. from outside influences. So you tend to get uh, longer um, pieces of DNA and more endogenous DNA. So more of the DNA you're interested in, more of the human DNA uh, in a petrous bone 
um, than of um, like soil bacteria, which is what we get an awful lot of when we're doing this this type of work. Uh, so yes, so in this case, it was the inner ear burn, the petrous uh -huh. burn. And is it true, Selena, that if you had done this work, say, early 2000s, it would have taken a lot longer? Yeah. Oh, well, I don't think. Do you know what I'm going to say? I don't think you could even have done what we did in 2000 um, because the way that we do the sequencing and the way mm. we do our work has changed dramatically in, in the time I've been doing it. So um, back in uh, 2000, we would have been sequencing the DNA using a process uh, called PCR. Mm -hmm. So when you do PCR, you uh, design what we call primers, and you basically target the DNA that you're looking for. So you say, I'm going to try and pick out a very, very small fragment of the DNA, usually from the mitochondrial genome, mm -hmm. and you, you pull that out, and that's what you sequence. Um, we don't really do that anymore. Now we, there is new sequencing technologies uh, called next generation sequencing. And what this means is that we, uh, rather than targeting these small fragments, we extract the DNA, as I was just describing, um, and then we actually sequence everything that's in that DNA extract. So all the different pieces. So rather than targeting and knowing what you're sequencing, Instead, we sequence everything which is there, which um, which has its pluses and its minuses. Mm -hmm. um, the minus being we sequence a lot of soil bacteria. <laughs> the yeah. plus being um, that you get everything. So we're not just getting the mitochondrial DNA anymore. Mm -hmm. We're getting the whole uh, of, of the nuclear genome as well. And the other thing with human DNA in particular is because we're not targeting it, we're not synthesizing it as you do in PCR, we're actually uh, um, getting all of the fragments that are there, we can actually authenticate that DNA as ancient. So mm -hmm. as I was talking earlier about the fact that DNA um, becomes damaged, as soon as an organism dies, what this does is create very specific damage patterns. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, a C, uh, a cytosine degrades to a uracil, so things like this. And basically, bioinformatically, you can use those little things to show that this is actually ancient DNA, and you can authenticate it as ancient because you can show these typical damage patterns um, and know that it's ancient and not that you've just sequenced yourself, mm -hmm. for instance. Whereas with PCR, you can't show those authentication um, methods. So, yeah, I really don't think we could have done this uh, properly. It's a lot faster now, in other words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's loads faster and loads better. <laughs> and it, it'll probably refine again, won't it? It's a, someone will come up with another way to refine it and make it even easier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always being refined. It's always it's always changing. Um, I mean, this was a big jump. This 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 change in sequence mm. is massive. But today, it's, it's a field that's constantly evolving. We're constantly... Um, looking at new methods to extraction, new methods to the bioinformatics is a big thing, trying to put all the pieces back together again, new methods of authentication. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it, it's constantly evolving. It's really, really interesting field to be working with, I have to say. Yeah. So what were the results of the DNA sequencing? What did Cheddar Man look like? And how can we be sure of these findings? Um, so in the case of Cheddar Man, we were actually sequencing his DNA as part of a much wider study uh, that was looking at many different individuals uh, to explore the uh, transition in the UK from a uh, Mesolithic hunter-gatherer to that of the Neolithic farmer. Um, and the results in the broadest context uh, from Cheddar Man um, helped, uh, helped to show that the genetic signature of a hunter-gatherer was very, very different to the genetic signature of a Neolithic farmer, um, meaning that different groups of people had moved into Britain at the same time as farming practices. Um, so a movement of people, not a movement of ideas, uh, is, is the broad context of what we were looking at with Cheddar Man results. Um, but in relation to Cheddar Man as an individual, uh, we showed several different things. 
Um, one is that he uh, did not have the genetic variants that would have allowed him as an adult to digest milk. So he would have been lactose intolerant. Um, this in itself is, is not particularly surprising uh, because obviously this was a time before farming and before domesticated animals. Right. So he uh, would likely not have been exposed to any dairy products anyway. Um, in relation to Cheddar Man's phenotype or what he physically looked like, uh, we describe Cheddar Man as having dark brown to black hair colour. Um, blue or blue-green eyes, and dark or dark-to-black skin pigmentation. So uh, I'm just going to focus straight in on the skin pigmentation result uh, because um, this is what's caused uh, the most issues for people. So human skin pigmentation is a very, very complex trait. It's what we call polygenetic meaning that there are many genes and many gene variants that affect it. Um, we probably don't know all of them, and we certainly don't know how they all interact. Um, indeed, it's fair to say that in recent studies from modern African populations, uh, they found more than 100 places in the human genome where people vary, where there are variations that can be associated with skin pigmentation. Um, so uh, to sort of clarify, these are sites in the genome where I might have a C and, and you, Mark, might have a T. And mm -hmm. when individuals have a different base at a single site, we call it a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP for short. So you mm -hmm. quite often hear people talking about SNPs, mm -hmm. and that's what they're talking about. So there are a lot of these SNPs associated with skin pigmentation. Some of these variations are found specifically within genes where we know the effect of those genes. And the effect of those genes are, um, they can be on genes that make either a different type or a different amount of melanin. Now, mm. melanin is the body's natural skin pigment um, and so this will affect the amount of skin pigment that an individual produces. We all, have, we it. all have it. Yes, yes, we all have those genes. Um, and these uh, these genes have names, and the important ones are ones like um, MC1R. And in Europe, uh, specifically in Europe, there's a suite called the SLC genes, um, 24A5 and 45A2 are the key ones, and another one called TYR. Um, but what's interesting is, so whilst there are many, many SNPs associated with skin pigmentation, the most recent studies are indicating that only a few of these SNPs, only a few of these variations, seem to be responsible the largest effects in skin pigmentation, so the largest differences, and that these SNPs um, are shown um, as signals of, of selection in populations through time. Mm -hmm. So with this kind of background in mind, we can go back to, to Cheddar Man um, and explain exactly what we did there. So what we did is to apply a specific tool called the H Iris Plex S system catchy name um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, it's actually used to predict the eye hair and skin pigmentation it's a tool uh, that's designed to be used uh, for forensic cases and to predict pigmentation based on variation so based on SNPs in an individual's genome so the eye color uh, test is based on six SNPs uh, the hair colour is based on 22, and skin pigmentation is based on 36 different SNPs. So this is not the, the 100 SNPs that you might find in a modern African population, but 36 SNPs that are known to have a large effect in Europe. So these are these ones like these SLC 24A um, and uh, 45A2 that I was talking about. And what this tool actually does is make a prediction based on a statistical model that has been trained on empirical, so real uh, um, data. 
And it, what it does is it gives a probability score that reflects the uncertainty, because of course this is actually very difficult to, to, to predict. So it reflects uncertainty by giving a probability score and these scores are then used to look at very broad categories of pigmentations, specifically a thing called the Fitzpatrick scale, which is used in um, dermatological skin uh, um, assessments, mm -hmm. and it categorizes skin pigmentation into six broad categories that range from, from very pale white right through to very dark brown black. Um, and it was this tool that we used to generate probability scores to predict the results. So when you say, can I be sure, can I be 100% sure? No, because it's a very complicated trait. And it's always possible that um, a genetic variant existed in the past. So there was perhaps a SNP in the past that we don't see any longer today that would have conferred a different skin pigmentation. However, as there seems to be a very strong selection for lighter skin pigmentation in more northerly latitudes, I think we're going to talk a bit more about this in a moment, I think, yep. um, then one would imagine that if this variant had existed in the past, then this too would have had a very strong selection for it to continue uh, in Europe, in northerly latitudes. And so we would still see it in modern populations. So in the absence of these unknown genes, but based on the genetic data that we obtained, the genetic variants within genes that we sequenced, the probability scores from these forensic, modern day forensic mm -hmm. tests that we applied. Personally, yes, I remain confident in our assessment um, that Cheddar Man had dark or dark to black skin pigmentation. And I, and I would also finally add that, that, that this wasn't actually unusual. Um, so there are other Mesolithic hunter-gatherer individuals whose genomes have also been sequenced uh, mm -hmm. from across Europe, and they too have been identified as having this darker skin pigmentation coupled with this very light eye combination. So to my mind, no, we, we really shouldn't even be that surprised by this result. I'm going to play uh, devil's advocate here. Uh, wouldn't an individual with skin as dark as that have had suffered health problems in those cold northern latitudes, especially with uh, vitamin D being so scarce? Well, Mark, yeah, this is actually really, really interesting um, because, of course, skin pigmentation is known to have a very high correlation with geographic and environmental variation. So populations at lower latitudes, those close to the equator, have a darker skin pigmentation and those at higher latitudes have a lighter skin pigmentation, so mm. traditionally. So scientists believe that this is likely an adaptation to ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So the closer to the equator you live, the more UV light you'll receive. And so with high levels of UV light, your, your skin needs to be protected from the damaging effects of UV, such as burning of the skin and, and skin cancers. And a darker skin pigmentation, mm -hmm. uh, which, as we said before, I think is caused by a greater concentration of melanin, that body's natural skin pigmentation. Melanin itself absorbs that UV light and is thought to protect skin cells from UV radiation damage. However, as you move further north, then the darker skin pigmentation becomes less important in terms of protecting the skin from UV light, as the amount of UV light is obviously decreasing. It gets a lot colder and a lot darker. Um, so instead, it's thought that the increased levels of melanin actually have the converse effect and they can have a detrimental effect on human health because whilst melanin actually absorbs UV light, mm. this reduces the amount of UV that's available for vitamin D synthesis. So vitamin D is very important. It's important for uh, muscular skeletal health. Um, deficiencies cause um, abnormalities in calcium, uh, mm. phosphorus, 
and bone metabolism. Um, and this can lead to problems with bone and muscle weakness. Um, in children, it leads to uh, skeletal deformities, also known as, as rickets. Um, and vitamin D is, is rather unique because it can be made in the skin from exposure to sunlight. Uh, so the increased levels of melanin in darker skin pigmented individuals reduce the skin's ability to produce vitamin D from sunlight. So as you were saying, a, a question that we often get is how would Cheddar Man survive in Britain with darker skin pigmentation when this would have reduced his ability to produce vitamin D? So there are several sort of answers to this. Um, one is that uh, Cheddar Man would have had a very different lifestyle. He would have had a much greater exposure to sunlight. He would have been outside, one would imagine, for, for, for most of the daylight hours. Uh, he would possibly have, have had less covering um, and therefore would have had more skin even exposed to the sunlight. The second point is that whilst vitamin D is synthesised through sunlight, it is also obtained through the diet. Um, sources of good or high levels of vitamin D can be found in oily fish, such as salmon, uh, mm. red meat, liver, and also mushrooms. Um, Cheddar Man, we know, or we think, had actually a very good diet because his teeth are, uh, are very healthy. Um, and as a hunter-gatherer, his diet would have likely included such foods as would have been high in vitamin D. Now, there's one other point here that's possible, and this is um, some work that came out recently uh, by uh, um, Hanel and Karlberg. And this suggests that there are variants in the genome, so this is back to these SNPs again, that can be um, associated with improved vitamin D transport and metabolism. So these might be variants that actually boost vitamin D efficiency in different individuals. So this would mean that individuals at a higher latitude to, could, could kind of negate the problem of low vitamin D intake, not through lighter the skin and improved uh, um, vitamin D from sunlight, but instead through uh, improved ability to process vitamin D and its metabolites. Um, I should stress this is not my particular area of expertise, but it certainly sounds really interesting to me and it could be worth exploring further as another alternative explanation as to how uh, um, people like Cheddar Man uh, would have survived in these northern um, latitudes in light of vitamin D. Well, some people watching this are now probably wondering just how it was that lighter skin tone evolved in those northern latitudes. So how did lighter skin come about? Hopefully I've explained um, what we know and don't know about the uh, the genetic basis for skin pigmentation and also something about the potential selective pressures or advantages that have, could have led to a lighter skin pigmentation in the more northerly latitudes. Um, but to address how we think that these gene variants spread in a more physical sense is probably best explained by the idea and the facts of these physical migrations of people. Um, now, the first migrations of people carrying these lighter alleles come from the um, Anatolian farmers. So these are the people for, from the Near East, so from modern day Turkey, who first started farming and who spread across Europe starting around 8,000 years ago. Um, the genes uh, or the gene variants of these early Neolithic farmers indicate that they would have carried these light or intermediate skin pigmentations and they also had um, dark, uh, dark hair and also dark eyes. Um, this migration was then followed later by a second wave of migrating people. These people um, originated from a region between the Caspian and the Black Sea. And these are the people known as the Yamnaya or um, steppe um, pastoralists. These people migrated also in an easterly direction across Europe, um, starting around 5,000 years ago. And they too carried these gene variants that we associate with lighter and intermediate skin pigmentations. And it's these people that also brought with them the variable eye colours and, uh, and some of the blonde hair. And so that combination of lighter skin and blonder hair that is more common today. Um, and so 
from genetic studies of both of these groups, so looking at lots of individuals, these Neolithic farmers and these Yamnayan steppe pastoralists, um, we can see that these lighter alleles were actually what we say were fixed in these populations, which means that the majority of people were carrying them. And um, remember, we're talking about Europe here. Um, and so the selective pressure from these northerly latitudes with this reduced UV, low vitamin D, they were farmers, so they didn't have that varied diet like the hunter-gatherer that I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. they had quite a limited diet, so they probably had low vitamin um, uh, D, they would have had vitamin D deficiencies, so this would have really pushed in these instances for the selection for the lighter uh, um, uh, skin uh, pigmentations to an even higher level, making it more fixed in these populations. Well, I'm sure the work on Cheddar Man is going to continue, but uh, what about your new and future projects? So what are you working on at the moment and uh, what's coming up? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate. I, I work on quite a lot of different projects. Um, I've got a, a nice one at the moment that's an ongoing project looking at um, museum bees. And this is looking at um, bees in the UK prior to land use change, prior to pesticides and comparing them with modern day bees to see if that's um, affected their genomes. Um, I'm involved in a couple of conservation genomic projects that I'm very proud of. Um, the one is looking um, in Colombia, looking at the Andean bear, uh, and the other is in Indonesia, looking at dwarf buffaloes and deer pigs. Wow. And uh, in both cases, what we're doing is using museum samples and comparing them to modern samples to look at the genomic impact of humans and particularly of habitat fragmentation. Um, I also work on extinct species, uh, so some giant ground sloths from South America, these big beasts of, uh, of the sloths from the past, and trying to um, understand what the genomics looks like as you actually approach extinction. Um, and uh, finally, some uh, really interesting work that, that's, that's really going forward. We've got a new PhD student, uh, and that's going back to look at the Goss Cave material. We're going to be looking at those cannibals. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, I'm dead excited. Oh, I wasn't meant to be joking. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> well, maybe we can have you back on and talk about that one day in the future. That would be fantastic. I would love to, Mark. This has been great. Well, this has been a really amazing discussion, Selena, and I'm grateful that you've been able to take the time out of your schedule to talk about your work. I will leave links to your talks and social media in the description below, and hopefully we can have you back on Evolution Soup sometime in the very near future. Thanks, Mark. It's been an absolute delight to be here. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, yeah, I'd love to come back again soon.